So when I'm chanting sometimes, you know, chanting to me helps cut through whatever is blocking me, whatever is making me attach. Mm -hmm. And um, what's beautiful about chanting, even a chant that I've done, I don't know, thousands of times, is that it makes evident where these moments of attachment are. Um, you know, even if you watch your thoughts a good deal, mm -hmm. almost de by definition, there's little lurkers in there <laughs> <laughs> that, that know right where to go, exactly, when you're, oh, he's looking in his thoughts, all right, into the corner, yeah. right? And uh, chanting... Uh, Lures them out. It really does. It brings them out. <clears throat> and then they announce themselves well. through a blockage of the chant. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, uh, to me, I know you've got a lot of, uh, questions about, uh, ta attachment, the nature of attachment, how to work with attachment. Mm -hmm. Um, is there a problem with attachment? Mm -hmm. And to me, one of the places to start is <clears throat> that attachment is that which blocks, uh, chanting, that you can feel oh. attachment, mm -hmm. uh, in the experience of chanting. Mm -hmm. And to me, what's important is to start with the feeling of attachment rather than immediately enter into the kind of argumentative or discursive space about defining attachment, whether attachment's a good thing or a bad thing, whether we can get rid of it, whether we can't get rid of it, and to just experience it and be with it. Mm -hmm. And once we <clears throat> are with it, then we are reminded that we're constantly getting instruction uh, by our own practice or by cosmos mm -hmm. that, oh, there's a little bit over here you need to work with, mm -hmm. you need to be with. What is that? Don't judge it necessarily right away. Don't reject it necessarily right away, but just be with it. To me, that's the beginning of working with attachment rather than on this kind of semantic level where you say attachment attachment is very bad i need to get rid of attachment okay am i done with attachment now well then then you're uh, either you know one of two things probably happens in my experience then you become attached to the lack of attachment or which is the more usual thing you decide that in fact attached some attachments are a good thing mm. and that you can only be human or that you can only be creative, or that you can only be fully present with attachment. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that resonates with your own experience. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, not everybody chants, of course. Uh, this is a great vehicle. We do a lot of chanting. It's a great vehicle for, for what we do. Um, we often chant Nirvana Shatikam. There's going to be a video up on that as well. <clears throat> it's a great way to, to categorize things to go after, to look for attachment. But I think you, you make a key point people miss. They think attachment is an intellectual exercise, that you can somehow mentally work your way through it. But for me, it's a very tactile thing. I mean, you can take um, some example, take a car or something that you're attached to. You don't even know what it is, but you know if it were gone, you would feel not so cool about it. And so trying to grok that, that feeling, just say, okay, I, I have this car or whatever, bicycle. I'm attached to this bicycle. I know I am, because if it went away, I'd feel really bad. And then just try to explore tactily what that sensation is. This, If you can feel the cling in your body, that you are attached to this bicycle or car or whatever, <clears throat> and you can sit, get into that space, and just feel that attachment and say, well, this is interesting, because I look at the background, and I look at this, how I feel differently when I bring the bicycle or the car into consciousness, and I feel the energy change in my body. So to me, that's where you can really get right up close and personal with attachment, not intellectually. Yeah. No, I agree entirely. It's this, uh, that feeling your way uh, through it and what it is the way. And when you feel it, what you feel is, is that, in fact, that clinging, which I think is the best description in my experience or grasping mm -hmm. uh, after uh, the object or the person that you feel that, in fact, you're not actually being with the bicycle or the car mm -hmm. or the person, mm -hmm. right? So 
the good news is that in fact you can enjoy the bicycle or the person or the car truly by working through and with the attachment as opposed to the just kind of blocking the flow of your relationship to the car or the bicycle or the person which then creates that clinging and is a palpably bad feeling. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's, a, that's a critical definition. <clears throat> that we, <clears throat> me, we, we, the attachment really doesn't help us. If we're attached to our partner, for example, we, do, we aren't fully present for them. And so we think, well, attachment's great. If I weren't attached to him or her, then you know, I wouldn't show I love them. I wouldn't cook dinner for I them. I wouldn't cook I wouldn't, dinner for you. Yeah. Whatever. Wouldn't, wouldn't do it. But in fact, you find exactly the opposite. That because you are attached to them, then you begin, you're up here all the time, and you're not really clearly experiencing them. So letting go of the attachment, not the thing itself. I mean, you, it isn't taking your car or your bike, bicycle or your girlfriend or boyfriend and just pushing them away. Not, not just like straight off the rock of Gibraltar no. to the Mediterranean. No, no, <laughs> it's, it's not that simple. People have tried that forever. Yeah. Renunciation, yeah. detachment, yeah. I'll just get rid of the thing. Mm-hmm. But then you're in your head, you're still deeply attached to it. Yeah. Even though it's gone from you, sure. you're, you have not let go of your attachment. And it can be there, conversely, and you'd not be attached to it. So it's not getting rid of the thing, it's getting rid of the feeling, the whole hanging, clinging on to the thing. Right, because the clinging, uh, you know, in the example of the, the, the partner or the spouse, for example, mm-hmm. that you, you brought up, it's really the attachment to, you know, your map for who that person is. Exactly. Why isn't that person being this way? You're not actually even attached to the person. No. You're attached to your own perspective on the person, and right. why won't that person cooperate right. with your perspective on that person? They're supposed to behave. Yeah. It's like, look, we've been over this a thousand times. <laughs> this is how you are. That's right. <laughs> this is how I am. Now, yeah. the interesting thing is, in my experience, as you let go of your attachments concerning other people or objects, you start to realize that you weren't who you thought you were mm-hmm. either. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably for most of us, it's difficult to go after immediately, except for a little bit at a time, our own map of ourselves as you know a, right. a, a form of attachment. Right. Right? We're attached to the I as we understand it, mm-hmm. rather than this field of awareness, which we are. Mm-hmm. Um, and by releasing our attachment to some particular preconceived map of the bike, the car, the person, mm-hmm. we actually experience somewhat more the person, the bike, the car, the garden, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And in doing that, we release our own fixed identity right. of ourselves. Right. So by releasing ourselves... Uh, of our attachment to other things, we actually release ourselves of our attachment to ourselves. And that feels palpably, I understand why, uh, you know, the language of liberation is used for that. Mm -hmm. Because the cessation of a very bad feeling is itself a good feeling. (laughs) And when you can be with, like, do it like, like, okay, let's see, I'm really attached to my folding bicycle that I got given as a present. Mm. Well, really, I, you know, I, I, you know, if if I be with that, I think, well, it's a beautiful thing that's come into my existence, and mm. but I don't feel the importance of it being a continued existence. Only I feel the importance of being open to its mm-hmm. existence in my life. Mm-hmm. I don't feel the existence of secure <laughs> the, the the insistence of securing that mm-hmm. in my life. It seems to me that attachment has a lot to do with this desire for securing X, Y, and Z in mm-hmm. our life. Mm-hmm. And that's an impossible project. You can't secure that within a life of constant change. No, but you have to realize it's impossible. I mean, to your, to your earlier point, Christian Marty had was a big one about saying you can only see yourself through relationship. Uh-huh. And you were talking about mapping. I mean, you have maps of people. And so we have expectations for how they will behave and how they will respond to what we, what our buttons are pushing back and forth. And so if you're not in any kind of relationship with anything, then you know you aren't mapping yourself. You aren't seeing, exposing yourself where you are attached. You can take, you can take your bicycle, but whatever. Mm. You can see something that's into your life. You can watch yourself getting attached to it, and you can see 
change is kind of changes happening in you because this thing is here now. And you can feel underneath that, well, what if this thing weren't there? Would I be okay? Would I be cool with that? And you say, oh, no, that would be good. Then, it's, then, then that's what you've got to work on. That's what yeah. you, can see. you can see, in fact, okay, I've mapped onto this object person thing. I've mapped onto that some expectation for how it will be forever in my life some way and how much happier I'll be if I have that. When, in fact, that attachment, as you correctly said, blocks your ability to actually be fully enjoying the bike the, the car, the person, whatever, because you're so worried about what if she or he leaves me? What if my bike gets stolen? Flat tire! Flat tire! <laughs> Whoa, it's d- disappointed me. It's got a flat tire. What's wrong with it? Um, yeah, you can really see yourself clear that way. And I think we get back to the whole thing about suffering and attachment. You really do suffer the more you are attached. Not because Buddha said that, because really you can watch it in your own life. The more you're attached to something, the more you're afraid of losing it, the more you suffer if it goes away. Right, and uh, when you dwell with or abide that feeling, when you say, oh, you know, what if that were to go out of my life? Hmm. Then this is where I personally find hmm. self-inquiry very useful. Hmm. Because you say, oh, like... What if she were gone? Mm-hmm. Right? You know. Then you say, well, who is that? Yeah. That feels that yeah. that feeling. Let, look, really look for who that being is that feels this need mm-hmm. to have that person, place, thing, mm-hmm. you know, condition right. in, in your life. And you look, you look, and you look, and you can feel the map dissolving. Mm-hmm. Because the map can't refer... Mm-hmm to what it's claiming to refer to, right. Right? right? There's an implicit map of the eye that says, I'm the kind of person that absolutely needs that bicycle, or else I just don't know what I would do. Mm-hmm. And you say, well, who is that mm-hmm. I? And that seems to be something that requires repeated practice and sort of intuition mm-hmm. to leave the level of words where we just ask who that is. Mm-hmm. And really use our consciousness to, to look, you know, just like, I don't know, you, you, you lose an earring in the, in the bathroom or a friend loses an earring in the bathroom. You don't just say, oh, well, you know, maybe it's around here somewhere, right? Like, you know, you get down there you look for it. Yeah, and you don't say, oh, well, this is the toilet. I better not look at it. No, you're going to look where the where, toilet is and you're getting be. down there. And it's like, you know, it's so strange that seek and you shall find, right? I mean, yeah. It didn't leave the bathroom, right? right? You right. know, it's down there somewhere. Yeah. And the same thing is true. You can say, well, maybe I'll look. I'm really interested in who I am. I'll look and see. Right. Oh, look, I'm a Scorpio. I'm a cusp with Libra. No. Right. Look. <clears throat> observe. Yeah. You well, know. And the, the brain develops a heuristic. I mean, if, if you do, who am I, what am I, what is this, enough times, the brain develops a heuristic. It just has a rule. It says, oh, here's the situation. I see the, the brain feel attachment, and it drops immediately into a feeling. It's a sensation. You can feel the brain shifting into, what is this thing that has this attachment? It happens so quickly and so subtly. You can just feel the energy shift. You don't have to voice anything, except vocalize it. And the thing disappears. It's just like, it's like magic. It gets, the brain gets so adept at this, adept at this, it just goes bang, 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 bang. And so the brain can learn how to do it. You have to do it enough times... The brain sees that it works, knows how that it works, and that's its new program. And, you know, I can, I can feel people saying, but but the eye which is experiencing that is like the pearl in the oyster. Mm. You know, the, the, mm. the sand comes in and then, or, you know, there's something beautiful about the tragic element of the world. There's something mm. beautiful about suffering. I experience oh, yeah. my greatest <clears throat> moments of love in experiencing, you know, the suf- suffering. Right. And, it's like, and I think that that is a problem of language, basically. I, I think that we say these words and we think that they're absolutely fundamental to a full experience. Mm-hmm. But what I think they're really pointing to is the, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, the, the monistic appreciation of good and evil, of the tragic and the comic, right? In other words, I think what people are afraid they're going to lose if they quote-unquote lose suffering, which is a funny way, is the tragic. But in fact, it's not 
you, you don't suddenly acquire rose-colored glasses and just say, oh, nothing negative ever happens. Only that the negative is an attribute of the one. So I see, you know, a dead bunny on the road near somebody's tire, and I really see it more than I would if I were attached and saying, ooh, I'm going to die. That's me. Right. So I, I, I think I can respect people. Uh, well, of course I can respect it, but I can sort of understand where this desire to hold on to suffering or this sense that suffering is about authenticity. Uh, and I think what people really mean when they say that, perhaps if I can be so bold, is that there has to be an appreciation for the tragic element of life, right? The way in which life includes death. But that only increases as we let go of uh, our uh, attachment because there's no I projecting some particular story onto the tragic or onto suffering. And it actually comes out more in its fullness. You can bear more of the tragic nature of life on planet Earth if you're not attached than if you are attached, or at least it's my experience. Yeah, but, but I think there's also a he- people who say, I love my suffering they are strongly attached to their suffering. Yes, I mean, they are. Their, their suffering is, is a, a state they, they find pleasure in. They're attached to suffering. And so they haven't made that loop back around that that's a fundamental problem. I mean, they're linked, they're hooked into their own suffering as an enjoyable, pleasurable state. And to, as you just said, it, try the other thing. I mean, yeah. to, to try not being attached to anything and see if your life is richer or not. Let go of your attachment to your suffering and just let completely just be open to the flow of the universe. Just be present second by second. Things come, things go. And see if your life isn't much, much richer than what it was before when you were attached to the, your suffering. Yeah. It's beautiful because, um, you know, we know that the attachment to the suffering. You know, Aristotle said that there could be no good story without conflict. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Basically, paraphrasing. Mm-hmm. And what we're really loving when we love our suffering is the drama. Mm-hmm. And we're loving that we have a story that we can tell mm-hmm. about our own unique mm-hmm. instance of suffering. Mm-hmm. And we're afraid, probably, that if we don't have our suffering, we don't have any story. Who are we? <laughs> well, and if, if the story is about me. I mean, I'm creating a story because there's a suffering there which reinforces the I, which I'm attached to this suffering, so there's an I back there holding on to this suffering. The I is what's being reinforced through this thing. And, to, you know, you like drama because it reinforces me. I get to be center stage on this thing. If you go back and deconvolute, deconstruct the I, you find, in fact, that you don't need that drama. You aren't attached to your suffering anymore. They because, just fall away. Yeah, you're, you're, you're not the stage, you're everything. Yeah, you're everything. And so you can let go of all of that suffering and attachment. Yeah, I would really encourage it, uh, kind of as you did a moment ago, bringing an experimental point of view on it. Mm-hmm. Saying, okay, fine, that's one hypothesis, that without suffering, you can't have a true, authentic mm-hmm. uh, existence. Mm-hmm. That's a hypothesis. Mm-hmm. Now try this hypothesis. Yeah, yeah. That's the suffering talking. Yeah. That's the I talking. Exactly. That's your addiction to the I talking. Right, right. Try this. Try this. And just see it. Which is what you just do it. And and you, you you will find the right choice. Whatever choice there is for you, try them both. Try A and try B. And see if B is not better than A. And I then, found out B is better than A. And then maybe we can stop arguing about it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Thank you.